Uh, thanks for joining. We're right at one o'clock. Um, I'm going to give folks a little bit of time to trickle in here, um, but I did want to start today off with a land acknowledgement. Um, we are virtual, but I at least am sitting on um, Corvallis area land, so I'll go ahead and read that land acknowledgement to get us started. Um, and I'll put some resources in the chat. This is a land acknowledgement that was shared by uh, Bessie Joyce, who works with the uh, New Beginnings for Tribal Students programs. Um, hopefully those links will work. Um, so I'll go ahead and get started. Some of you have heard this before. Um, I would like to take a few minutes to pause and reflect upon the indigenous peoples whose land we occupy here in the Willamette Valley and Oregon coast. There always have been since time immemorial and always will be indigenous peoples stewarding this land that we all call home. The Willamette Valley was and is still occupied by the many tribes of the Kalapuya who were forced to relocate to reservations following the Willamette Valley Treaty of 1855. Today, living descendants of the Kalapuya are largely members of the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde. The, tribal, the tribes and bands occupying much of South and Central Oregon coast were forced to move between 1855 in 1860 to Port Umpqua and then to Yahats where they were held. Descendants of these people are now members of either the Confederated Tribes of Coos, Lower Umpqua and Sayusla Indians or the Coquille Tribe or Siletz Tribe or the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ron. I invite you to take a few seconds now to contemplate with gratitude and curiosity the history and ongoing presence of indigenous peoples whose land we occupy, their survival and ongoing contributions to society, education systems, and land stewardship. And with that, an invitation to learn to be of service to the self-determination and sovereignty of these and all indigenous peoples. Thank you to our many indigenous partners and hosts. Thank you for your presence here today and so many of us are guests in this beautiful, abundant land. All right. Thanks, everybody, for joining today, and welcome to the 2021 Summer Scholars Final Symposium in this virtual space. We're super excited to have you all here and to hear from these students who've been working so hard all summer. Um, we are recording today, so scholars, you'll get a chance to see your presentations after the fact if you want. Uh, you don't have to if you don't want to. Um, I've also put together a little um, feedback form and I'm gonna put it in the chat and I'll continue to drop it in the chat as we go through today. Um, hopefully if you folks click on that, it'll bring up all the different students' names and we'd be very grateful for you providing them constructive feedback on their talks today. Um, and then you can just bring up a new form and then start the process over again. Um, the students are going to take turns talking. Uh, they'll do about eight minutes of speaking and sharing PowerPoint slides. Um, and then we'll have a chance for a couple questions for each student at the end of their presentation. Um, I'd like to invite Sarah to give us a brief um, introduction to the Summer Scholars Program. Sarah, if you wouldn't mind doing that now, that'd be great. Happy to. Thank you, Jenny. Welcome, everyone. It's great to see you all here today on Friday the 13th. Um, so this is our 11th Summer Scholars uh, Symposium, um, and uh, I'm just delighted uh, that we have so many folks who are interested in this program and have been so supportive over the years. I want to acknowledge all of our mentors, folks who've been with us for years, and new mentors. You are the foundation on which this program is built. Um, all of the other folks who are behind the scenes or acting as co-mentors or support within your lab or your agency and parents and friends and all those folks who help support these interns. Um, I want to acknowledge the interns themselves, all of the uh, risks that you're taking this year in terms of trying new things and going out um, and embarking on these fellowships, whether they're virtual or in person, hopefully managed risks, but you know, finding out what you want to do and what you don't want to do um, and doing it with us and then telling us about it in the blogs and during these presentations. So we're grateful for you being a part of this. Um, Jenny 
is an amazing uh, coordinator for these efforts, keeping everybody connected and keeping communication going. Stephanie has been really instrumental with you know, helping to organize our processes around review and all of our many folks who help review the applications, um, giving us feedback. Summer scholars, we definitely invite you to stay in touch with us, uh, review applications in the future, um, tell us where you are, what you're doing, uh, we um, love to hear your next steps, whether it has nothing to do with coastal ocean stuff or whether it's directly related to the work you're doing here, please let us know and reach out. Um, and then also just want to acknowledge um, uh, Oregon Sea Grant for helping to support this effort and um, you know make this a worthwhile opportunity. Uh, virtual feels kind of familiar and comfortable this year, but hopefully by 2022, we get to uh, convene in person. And so if you're still in the Oregon area at that time, um, we'll include you in our invitation so you can come and celebrate in person. And so I'm looking forward to hearing these presentations. So I turn it over to Jenny to continue emceeing our event. Awesome, thank you so much, Sarah. Okay, so without further ado, I think I'm going to introduce our first two speakers. And you two, you can remind me if you're just presenting jointly or separately. Um, it's Joshua Fackrell and Charlotte Klein who are going to be presenting um, for the Oregon Coastal Ocean and Information Network. Thank you, Jenny. I'll share my screen here. Okay. Can you all see my presentation? Great. So I'm Charlotte Klein. I'm an undergraduate student at the University of Oregon, majoring in spatial data science and technology and environmental science. Hello, I'm Joshua Fackrell. I'm a student at Portland State University in the environmental science and management department. And as Jenny said, we were interns at the Oregon Coastal and Ocean Information Network, also known as OCOIN. So what is OCOIN? OCOIN was developed to facilitate long-term collaboration among researchers, managers, and policymakers working on coastal and marine issues in Oregon with the hope of fostering science-driven policy. What makes OCOIN unique is that it emphasizes cross-institutional and transdisciplinary collaboration. OCOIN has researchers from multiple institutions, a variety of state organizations, as well as policymakers. The OCOIN network provides the opportunity for their members to collaborate in their work. This collaboration helps better provide what the Oregon coast needs. OCOIN developed several tools to further our goals. The Coastal Research Explorer, the Oregon Coastal and Marine Directory, and outreach tools like the annual workshop. The Coastal Research Explorer is our, sharing, our data sharing tool developed using ArcGIS Online, which situates research projects from around Oregon on a mapping tool where users can sort projects by topic and explore past, present, and future research occurring on the Oregon coast. This site also provides links for data sharing and access to journal articles for specific research projects within the tool. OCOIN also developed the Oregon Coastal and Marine Directory a LinkedIn of sorts for the researchers and managers who are involved in the OCOIN network. And finally, to keep OCOIN's network connected throughout the year, OCOIN undertakes outreach efforts, including biannual newsletters, featuring novel research within the network and our partnership organizations, as well as a fall OCOIN annual meeting with keynote speakers and a chance for the OCOIN network to connect. With OCOIN, we worked directly with the steering committee, which included members of the executive outreach and technical committees, all of which work to support members of the OCOIN network. OCOIN is operated by volunteers, all of whom work professionally supporting Oregon coastal communities. This provided us with the opportunity to meet professionals from all over Oregon to help to support Oregon's coast. OCOIN's most productive time is in the summer when interns are dedicated to supporting the network. Charlotte, Charlotte and I worked remotely, often over Zoom, whether it be a committee meeting or our daily Zoom work parties together. Even though we were in different cities, working together over Zoom provided a productive working environment. We supported projects from the executive outreach and technical committees. 
It was wonderful collaborating on all of our work, supporting each other as we grew with the network. On the technical side of things, our daily tasks were often related to the Coastal Research Explorer tool and the Coastal and Marine Data Network. Early on in the summer, Joshua and I did a lot of trainings for ArcGIS Online and Survey123, the survey mechanism that we used um, within ArcGIS Online to gather research from researchers around Oregon. And as Joshua mentioned, uh, the whole Oakland team is fully remote. So a lot of our work days looked like this screenshot with Joshua and I in a Zoom meeting, um, working on the back end of our research survey. And in this particular image, Joshua and I are editing the survey tool so that researchers can have a field to enter in their journal articles um, associated with the research that they're conducting. And one of our more extensive projects included the design and implementation of a um, more user-friendly legend that makes scanning projects easier on our Coastal Research Explorer. And I'm going to navigate to our actual Research Explorer so we can show you it live. So here's our actual Coastal Research Explorer website. Right now I'm in the All Research tab um, and Joshua and I, uh, implemented this splash screen to show people about our new legend, um, but it appears in the right hand here with projects sorted by completed, newer, unstarted, and ongoing. And you can click on one of those categories, and then you see the title of um, the research project, the main researcher, and their affiliated institution. Um, and when you click on a particular project, you get to see the geographic extent of that research and other details. Um, one of our tasks with OCoin this year was also uh, changing the geographic locations of the research. Previously, the tool had only allowed uh, specific points to represent the ge geographic location of research. And we um, went through and translated a lot of the projects into these polygons to actually represent where the research was being conducted. Um, and it's a lot more informational. You can zoom in whoop, and um, see our pop-ups have more uh, information like abstract and project status and data availability and whatnot. For our presentation, at the end, we'll link um, to that site so that you can take a look for yourself. There we go. All right, so for the outreach committee, we drafted a newsletter providing OCoin updates, as well as spotlight articles on research and an OCoin partnership. We each conducted interviews for the spotlights, which provided us with the opportunity to connect with people to help support Oregon's coast. I interviewed Dr. Britta Baker about her microplastics research. She looked at the ecological prevalence of microplastics in Pacific oysters and Pacific razor clams. She then looked at human microplastic exposure by Pacific razor clam consumption. In her interview, she emphasized the broadness of microplastic pollution stakeholders, why continuing research is important, and the need for broad microplastic policy. This was not only an amazing opportunity to learn about her research and to practice my science communication, but it was valuable for me in my professional and academic life. I am starting graduate school next year and plan to do research with microplastics. Um, my interview was able to shift a little from the spotlight to a space to gain some insight from my own research as I transition into graduate school. This interview was the most exciting part of my internship. It was Dr. Baker's dissertation defense that prompted me to join the lab that she had been a part of at Portland State University. For my part of the newsletter, I was tasked with interviewing an OCoin partner. And this year we chose the Ocean Observatories Initiative which is an NSF funded global network of ocean observing arrays that collect real-time data and ocean climate conditions. And for this, I interviewed the Ed, Professor Ed Deaver from Oregon State, who is the principal investigator and project scientist at the Pacific Northwest Coastal, Coastal Component of OOI, which is called the Endurance Array. Um, and the Endurance Array is 
a lot of different gliders and buoys and um, technology that uh, collects biological and climatic and um, physical conditions of the ocean. Um, and OOI is an organization that is aimed at data sharing, similar to OCoin. And like Joshua, I really enjoyed this uh, opportunity to interview um, a scientist who's working in the field and doing this data sharing that is similar to OCoin. Um, and it was a really eye-opening experience. So pictured to the right is a screenshot of our newsletter. Uh, we were able to send it out through MailChimp, which is another program that we are able to learn that is valuable for our field. Another important aspect of outreach has been updating the research on the Coastal Research Explorer. First, we updated a couple of surveys to assist the network in updating research. To the right is a survey that we learned to update from ArcGIS's backend. We also created a survey in Google Forms to update existing research projects. This has been a great learning experience. We have sent out hundreds of personalized emails to researchers, allowing us to update existing research and add new projects. In this, we have added a handful of aquaculture projects, which is something that we were specifically tasked with. We have also added a new section on the site that links to the researchers' articles. Working with all this data, we have been able to see what research is happening on Oregon's coast and has given us a broader view of who is conducting this research. With one week to go, the work is not over as we continue to connect with researchers to get the most up-to-date information. When reflecting on our time with OCoin, originally the Coastal Research Explorer stood out as a platform for researchers and managers to view current research. However, throughout our internship, we have grown to see what OCoin can offer in terms of co collaboration between managers, researchers, and policymakers. This collaboration can help facilitate more targeted research, helping to close the gap on what professionals need to provide protection for our coast. The network is larger than we originally thought, with the OCoin Steering Committee and OCoin Partnerships, we've become acquainted with researchers, managers, and policymakers to help support Oregon's coast. We've been able to connect with people by attending meetings, informational interviews, and collaboration through email. It is encouraging to see people collaborate through OCoin to help support Oregon's coast, and we are proud to be a part of OCoin's growth this summer. In addition, we were involved with um, tasks on the executive committee planning for the future of OCoin. We helped draft a budget for OCoin. I'm just doing a listen in um, on a meeting this afternoon. Um, to provide a year or to support year round intern for staffing and continuity with OCoin um, and to fund efforts like our annual meeting and our growing software needs. And this exercise helped Joshua and I learn about how to write um, budget component justifications and learn about accountability and reporting structures. And as we round out our internship, we are helping to plan OCoin's annual meeting that takes place in the fall. This year, the meeting will be held virtually and be guided by the theme of transdisciplinarity and cross-institutional partnership, which are at the heart of what OCoin helps provide for our network. And this meeting will feature networking sessions and speakers from research institutions, as well as Oregon policymakers. And even though this meeting will take place after the end of our internship, we're both planning on attending. So what's next for us? I hope to be able to continue to support the OCoin network, attending the annual meeting this fall and exploring how else I can provide my support after my internship. This internship has provided the experience that I was looking for. When applying, I was hoping to learn the new, some new technical skills to add to my resume. And at the top of that list was ArcGIS. With the technical steering committee, I received hands-on training, an ample supply of tutorials to do on my own time, Charlotte's expertise, and the opportunity to put it all to use. I also learned to use Esri's survey one, two, three, which is something that I was not even aware of. In addition, I was provided the opportunity for professional development that was not directly related to OCoin. One such opportunity is that I was supplied with tutorials to strengthen my skills with the programming language R. Looking forward, I will start graduate school in the fall where I'll be working towards my master's degree as a part of the Applied Coastal Ecology Lab at Portland State University. And for me this year, I'll be entering my final year at the University of Oregon 
And I'm really grateful for the experience with Oregon Sea Grant this summer and with Ocoin uh, because it's helped clarify some of my career uh, aspirations. Outside of the skills outlined by Joshua and I in this presentation, I also gained valuable networking experience and connections. Um, one opportunity that we had was to sit in on a meeting with the Oregon Department of Land Conservation and Development and one of our technical committee mentors, Tanya Haddad. Um, and it was cool to see um, what careers are available um, in kind of the spatial data and coastal um, crossroads. And I was also able to have a couple of coffee chats with um, NOAA professionals who um, I was put in contact with by my Sea Grant CEI mentors, which were all really helpful. Thank you for the opportunity to be a summer scholar with the Oregon Sea Grant. And thank you for listening to our experience at Ocoin. Are there any questions? Great job, you two. Thank you. There is a question in the chat that I think is meant for both of you. Can you see it or you need me to read it? The question is, read it. you got it? Go ahead. I can read it. So which of the tools that you use seem the most useful for your future um, pursuits, grad school, job, another internship, et cetera? Um, so are you referring to the Ocoin tools or things that we learn, like skills we learned? I, I feel like you both answered that question in your wrap up slide. Uh, so I, you know, that's what I get from asking a premature question. So if there's anything else you want to elaborate on beyond, you know, GIS and, you know, just general networking and um, uh, people skills, then please do that. But also if anybody else has a question, you can address their question too. Great job, you guys. I'll, I'll add on to mine. Um, so originally when we were starting the um, internship, we were separated by technical and outreach. I was outreach. Charlotte was technical because she has more skills there. Um, but we quickly decided that we both wanted to learn each other's expertise. So we, the entire time, split everything 50-50. And that was amazing. So without that, I wouldn't have had the opportunity to learn the technical skills as much that I was looking for. So it was amazing that we were like, we were provided the opportunity to explore and learn what we wanted to. Yeah, I would echo that. And the collaboration between Joshua and I really helped make this uh, internship great. And it helped like me be able to plan out my day better and learn from Joshua. Um, and so I'm, I'm very happy with that as well. Thanks, you two. Sounds like you had an awesome mini cohort going on there. That's one of the strengths of Ocoin, I think. Okay, so um, Joshua and Charlotte, if you feel comfortable doing so, you could put your contact information in the chat and that way if folks have additional questions, they can reach out to you directly. Um, we're gonna go ahead and introduce our next speaker, um, McKay Reuter, who has been working with Oregon Sea Grants Eat Oregon Seafood Initiative and who is calling in today from her new location in Guam. Welcome, McKay. Hi, everyone. Sorry, it looks like my computer doesn't want to share its screen. Um, okay, my computer is not wanting to screen share. So Jenny, can I send you a link and would you be able to share it for me by any chance? Sure, no problem. Anything can happen on Zoom. Um, so I'm not sure if I can get access to Canva, McKay. Do I have to log into that? Mm. Sarah or Stephanie, are you regular Canva users?
what about as a suggestion maybe mckay and i can figure it out uh on the back end and maybe somebody else can go next do you want to try that that could work too i think i just sent jenny a powerpoint as well okay great let me check okay where are you guys you heading back Hey, McKay, the PowerPoint hasn't come through yet. So let's switch gears and have, um, let's see who is next on my list. Um, Amishi Singh from uh, the Haystack Rock Awareness Program. Amishi, are you comfortable going now? And then um, McKay and I will adjust here. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, super. Thanks. All right, can you all see the slides? All right, yeah, so my name is Amishi Singh. I am currently an undergraduate student at the University of Washington. And this summer, my project was all about optimizing the virtual field trip programs at the Haystack Rock Awareness Program in Cannon Beach. A little more about um, Haystack Rock Awareness Program, probably best to start with what Haystack Rock actually is. It is a federally and state protected, both intertidal and nesting seabird site. And the whole, program, Haystack Rock Awareness Program, is centered on preserving Haystack Rock. And this is actually the mission statement for ATRAP um, to protect through education the intertidal and bird ecology of the Oregon Marine Garden and National Wildlife Refuge at Haystack Rock in Cannon Beach. And as you can see, education is a really big part of that mission statement. And one of the ways that they accomplish this is through field trips for elementary through high schoolers. And when COVID happened last year, they switched to doing it in a virtual format over Zoom and Facebook Live. And I think all of us who have been virtual for the past year or so kind of know that that's not always the most effective and engaging way to kind of reach your audience. And that's kind of where my project comes in. Um, so my project was to make recommendations to improve the current program. And I did this through literature review, content analysis, and interviews with some teachers. And I think by now I've mentioned a few times this idea of engagement, we're trying to increase engagement. And why is that important? So there's a study from 1982 that said that early positive childhood experiences with nature and with the outdoors can lead to better conservation attitudes as you grow up. So it's really important to have these like early experiences with nature in order to have those conservation attitudes as you're growing up. And so by trying to promote those experiences, you can try to promote those conservation attitudes down the line. So a little more about the actual literature review I did. I focused on three main topics. The first one was 21st century learning, which is a focus on educating from a practical standpoint and preparing kids to go into the workforce with actual practical knowledge that can be applied. So big shift away from the lecture-based learning that I think most of us are familiar with. Focuses a lot on themes like collaboration and inquiry and STEM integration. And the biggest shift in this is that it kind of shifts the role of a teacher away from being like a dispenser of information, like handing out facts to being more of like a facilitator for sharing information. The second main topic I focused on was the current field trip practices and barriers that a lot of teachers face. Um, this is actually where I found one of the most surprising facts that I had the whole time I was working on this project, which is that a majority of teachers are unable to explain how field trips ultimately lead to student learning. And I thought that was really interesting. Um, and I don't know, it's really shocking that teachers a lot of times like can take kids on a field trip and put so much time into it and ultimately are unable to explain like, why does this connect to your learning? Like, how are you teaching someone something through this? And along with that obvious big barrier, there's also a lot of logistical issues such as cost, travel, time, as well as an emphasis on standardized testing that we see now. So that was kind of the big second category that I researched. And then the third one was environmental education. And in this, I kind of focused on two main categories environmental education methods and models, as well as the idea of age-appropriate environmental education. So with age-appropriate environmental education, I focused on two main groups, younger kids like elementary and then older kids such as high schoolers, and found that for younger kids such as elementary schoolers, the best method to engage them with environmental science is through small local projects and just kind of introducing them to nature as a whole versus the idea of like environmental issues. 
And allowing them to engage in small community projects such as community gardens or neighborhood cleanups is a really good way for them to see the impact that they can have on the environment and really view it as like a cause and effect relationship that they have with their surroundings. Now getting into older kids, um, they already kind of have that awareness of the environment and environmental issues. And a lot of times we see this thing called climate anxiety where older people are already know what's going on and they're very nervous about it and they're very anxious about it, especially now. And so one of the best ways that they found to combat that is by offering lots of connections to people who are already working in environmental fields and just environmental professionals and just kind of seeing like, this is what they are doing and here's how you can get involved tends to be the best way to involve older students. So looking at all of that literature, as well as having an interview with two elementary school teachers, I made four main recommendations for ATRAP. The first one was switching to an asynchronous platform from this Zoom slash Facebook Live format that they're currently doing. This addresses the biggest barrier that this addresses is the idea of time, especially this allows you to access different time zones. If you have an asynchronous module that's already set up that teachers can access on their own time that has like worksheets and videos, things of that nature. So that's the biggest suggestion I made. And kind of going along with this is this idea of like a teacher guide. Obviously, when you switch to an asynchronous format, the onus of actually dispensing information switches from HAP to the teachers. So having a guide that kind of explains just like the basics of like intertidal ecology, as well as like how these activities should be used and kind of the goals that they are presenting, I think would be a very useful thing. And coming back to the fact that a lot of teachers don't really know how this connects to their own classrooms, making these like curriculum connections very direct and very explicit would be very helpful. The main way this could be done is literally labeling worksheets and videos with like this is the curriculum that it connects to. And this kind of curriculum would be the NGSS curriculum, also the Next Generation Science Standards, which is very commonly used, especially through the Pacific Northwest. And I didn't fully want to get rid of the live component of like a Zoom or a Facebook Live. I think it's a really good way to connect with people, but kind of switching it from like an actual field trip to maybe a bi-weekly or a monthly thing where we can really focus on connecting with professionals, kind of addressing this idea of like what older kids want. I think would be really helpful. Um, just kind of being able to talk to like volunteers. And there's also a lot of research that goes on at Haystack Rocks. So like being able to bring in volunteers and researchers and staff to be able to just like talk about their experiences. How did they get involved? What did they get out of it? I think would also be really useful to those kids who kind of want something more than just basic facts and information. So what are the next steps in this research? Obviously to first, you need to build out this virtual platform. You need to get all these activities and worksheets and everything loaded in here. And then after that, I think the end goal should be to kind of do a comparative study between the engagement levels that you get from in-person versus this updated virtual platform. There's also a lot of gaps in the current research, especially for virtual education. It, the research, there's a lot more this year than there was before, but it's still kind of a little bit lacking. And some of the biggest areas that that's lacking is there's no comprehensive study on the effects of different environmental education models compared to the other ones. And I think that would be really useful research to know what works better, especially for certain age groups. And there's also a big lack of research in what works for middle schoolers. A lot of the research in environmental education for K through 12 tends to focus mostly on elementary schoolers. And then there is a lot about teenagers, especially high schoolers, but there's like a huge gap for like the couple years in between that. And so I think those are some really big areas. And I think one of the biggest things that this experience has taught me is to kind of stop thinking about virtual education as a replacement for in-person. And I think when you start to see it as it's like own separate thing, I think it opens up a lot of opportunity for where this research can go and what opportunities this could open. So big thank you to everyone who helped me with this project. Definitely could not <laughs> have done it without all the support I got. And yeah, thank you for everyone for listening and I'm ready to take any questions. Awesome job. <clears throat> Thanks, Amishi. Does anybody have any questions for Amishi? Feel free to unmute or put it in the chat. Hey, Amishi, this is Liz Parati, ODFW. Um, really great presentation. Um, I missed what you said were the years of the gap in education. And I was wondering, based on your review of the science standards, if um, maybe the curricula didn't match close enough to science standards for those grades or if you had another idea about that? 
I think a lot of what that is, is that it's very vague in terms of the, a lot of the research with environmental education. So even with elementary schoolers, it tends to be like, they like community versus like high schoolers like this. And I think a lot of the research also describes it in terms of like younger kids versus older kids, which are very ambiguous terms. But I think the science standards also do look at middle school, like sixth through eighth in a really weird way where a lot of it is very vague. And they're just like, there's so much more room for expansion. And I think like a 13 year old has very different mindsets than like a 16 year old. So kind of grouping it all by like older, younger is a really weird way. But I think there's definitely a lot more room for that. And I think that it's a huge opportunity for more research. Thanks, Amishi. And I think you have one more um, quick question from Tommy Swearingen in the chat. Will you pursue related environmental education roles in the future? I think so. I think environmental education is really interesting. And I think it's really important to get young people involved in the environment in sciences, especially right now. So I think that's definitely something I'm interested in pursuing in the future. Awesome. Thanks, Amishi. OK, Thank so you. I'm still um, coordinating with McKay about getting her set up ready to go. So let's go ahead and have um, Andrea present next, also with Haystack Rock Awareness Program but doing a different project from Amishi. Andrea, are you ready to go now? Yeah, I'm ready. Let me just share my screen. Okay. And I will leave my camera off because I'm scared the Wi-Fi will act up. <laughs> no worries. OK. Um, oh, why am I doing <laughs> My brain is confused. OK. So. Um, Okay, so my name is Andrea Vega, and I recently just graduated from the University of California, Santa Cruz with a degree in environmental studies. And this summer I worked in partnership with Haystack Rock Awareness Program and Friends of Haystack Rock. The Haystack Rock Awareness Program is a government organization and the Friends Group is a nonprofit that specializes in promoting environmental stewardship and actively works towards preventing ecosystem degradation at The Rock. Um, I conducted a study focused around communicating science to the general public and maximizing engagement and interest in marine stewardship and preservation. Um, so, wait, I think I skipped a slide, sorry. This project was developed to provide a recommendation for HRAP and the Friends Group that will maximize their engagement with the visitors at The Rock and their online community. The objective of this study was to identify the preferred method of delivery and the different types of content that we can curate um, based off of the science communication that we would like and to formulate a recommendation based on the findings. So by implementing these methods, we may be able to optimize environmental stewardship and encourage the community um, by empowering them with science communication content and with strategies. Um, so here is a quote by the Ocean Foundation's mission statement that was very relevant to my project. Um, it's part of their mission statement, a healthy marine ecosystem where all wildlife thrives as a result of an informed, compassionate and engaged community. Um, the general public's tolerance and understanding of conservation and preservation of wildlife efforts may be supported by communicating relevant scientific information. To engage interest and involvement from the community, science communication can provide an organic integration of conservation and environmental literacy. And this has the potential to enable visitors of Haystack Rock to make decisions for the benefit of the environment. Uh, there is an identifiable widening gap between people and nature that can be attributed to the lack of environmental literacy and connection. The successful integration of science communication for preservation effort, efforts could provide a foundation for getting involved. So this summer, I got to work on three different projects, and these projects allowed me to explore many components of science communication in real time. The Friends social media project goal was to maximize engagement on Facebook and Instagram, although there was an emphasis on maximizing social media engagement. In-person methods were used to assess general marine conservation and preservation interest. Within this project, I was able to implement methods of communication that I believed would be most effective for engaging an audience. The following methods were used, informational on tufted puffin research with accessible language for adults and children, 
library lectures led by researchers, social media posts, um, and all sides of Haystack Rock video series. There was also a Puff and Watch event and an infographic for local community science projects. The second project was a community science project that was led by a graduate student from OSU that focused on investigating the diets of coastal Oregon birds and how they might change over time through non-invasive community source photography. This project targeted um, experienced nature photographers and birders in hopes of maximizing their collection of coastal avian species. Um, photography and understanding of what coastal Oregon birds eat throughout the year. This project had allowed me to work on a newly developed community science project and understand the importance of outreach and communication. And the third and final project that I worked on was the HRAP science communication study with the goal to maximize engagement and interest in marine preservation efforts in science. I conducted a human dimension study in which I used a series of surveys and conducted interviews to figure out the preferred method of delivery for science communication to use this to facilitate dialogue about marine preservation and stewardship by maximizing engagement and interest from the general public. And all these projects tied together to work under the overarching theme of science communication and using it for preservation efforts and getting the general public to care about the environment. Oh, I keep skipping it. And um, the methods for the friends group, there were two main methods that were used for this social media project. And the two were accessible language um, of scientific research and outreach methods to increase engagement. For the accessible language, I made a set of informationals that were curated based off of the the Tufted Puffin Monitoring Study conducted by Sean Stevenson from the US Fish and Wildlife Service in 2018. This study focused on the possible causes for puffin decline by conducting a borough nesting seabird survey across the Oregon coastline. To make the research more accessible in language, a mature and younger audience version was made. The version for the younger audience was made with the target of introducing three key themes. The three target themes were community science project, awareness, research, and preservation. The informational made for a more mature audience contained a larger volume of information, but the language remained accessible and scientific jargon was eliminated. The three key themes remained the same throughout, but there was an expansion on the themes and provided more information relating to the research that was conducted by the US Fish and Wildlife Service. With the public outreach and engagement facilitating um, method, we wanted the dialogue around science education and communication with the general public to improve. So outreach and preservation and conservation um, helps increase awareness and support around issues affecting the environment. A few techniques for public outreach were used. Um, we use QR codes for social media, interactive social media posts, a video series, farmer market events, and Puffin Week. Two main goals were targeted using these different techniques. The two main goals were general engagement with the public and assessing their interest in marine preservation and conservation through conversations. And the second objective was to translate the identified preferences into social media. So with the social media posts and video series that were curated, it was a reflection of this assessment that was made using those methods. And then here are the informationals that were curated, the junior science one that is just a little more fun for the kids, but it also could target middle schoolers and high schoolers if that were the case. And same with the more mature audience. Um, interviews and surveys, this is the method section for HRAP, and interviews and surveys were the methods used to collect data about the preferred method of delivery for science communication for the general public. Additionally, personal narratives surrounding marine stewardship and preservation were also targeted in order to maximize engagement and interest in these areas. Data collection was done using a series of three surveys and through it, the administration of interviews that target the general public at Haystack Rock, marine science and conservation researchers, HRAP staff, and longstanding locals at Cannon Beach. 
the general public and researcher surveys provided information on how the knowledge gap can be filled with science communication. Through the surveys administered to researchers, it revealed that 94% of them believe that there is a knowledge gap between the research community and the general public, and 82.3% agree that science communication could facilitate scientific dialogue between the two communities. 64% use social media to connect with their peers, and 53% use social media to share their research with the general public. The general public survey revealed that the majority of the public used Instagram and Facebook and was the same result for the researchers. To maximize engagement and collaboration between researchers and the general public and bridge the knowledge gap between them, social media can be used as a common ground to learn and teach about marine conservation issues. By promoting by providing more consistent content and forming a connection that could increase confidence to take on more interest in science. And these statistics are from the general public surveys. The first graph shows the level of interest in receiving information about marine preservation. They were asked to rank their level of interest and 38.7% ranked their level at three, that being the highest and in the bottom graph, people were asked to rank their level of interest in becoming involved in marine preservation efforts, and 34.4% ranked interested as that being the highest. Surveys were also um, revealed that the majority of people preferred three to five minute long videos and reading materials for their science communication updates and learnings and prefer them to be on social media, Instagram and Facebook specifically, and 41% prefer these updates weekly. So this information allows us to make assessment on how we can conduct a plan to present science communication in the most effective way possible and get people to engage. Andrea, just a quick note that you're at eight minutes. Okay, and now I'm at the recommendation. So based on the methods used, um, we were highlighting um, that we wanted there to be similarities and highlight that they could do this. Um, sorry, <laughs> we wanna ex extend the framework from being solely based on the preservation of haystack rock and moving towards a framework that includes haystack uh, rock in a global scale so that this can create a general public empathic understanding and response so that there can be an increase in people wanting to care for the environment and also social strategy can be implemented um, in which environmental education, strategic communication, social marketing, capacity building and community outreach and social media can be used as the most effective way to relay science communication content and increase engagement marine preservation interest. And here are my acknowledgements. Thank you to everyone that helped me with my project. And thank you so much to C Grant. This has been an amazing experience. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks so much, Andrea. Um, if you wouldn't mind posting your info in the chat, um, we are going to jump ahead to McKay's presentation. Um, but if folks have questions for Andrea, please feel free to message her. Um, and uh, let's see here if McKay and I can tag team on this PowerPoint. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen for you, McKay, and um, we'll see how this goes. Thank you, Jenny. Sorry again to everyone about the small technical difficulties. No worries. Okay, so. Does this look right, McKay? Yeah, it looks like some of the settings are a little off, um, but that's fine. <laughs> okay. Perfect. Can everybody hear me? Awesome. Sweet. So, hi everyone. My name is McKay Reuter. I am a recent graduate from Oregon State University, and I am currently a master's student at the University of Guam. Uh, and today I'm going to talk about my experience as a summer scholar with the Eat Oregon Seafood Initiative. Next slide. So for a quick presentation outline, first I'm going to introduce the Eat Oregon Seafood Initiative, then I'll talk about what my role is within the initiative. I'll give a brief overview of my summer projects. I'll talk about the main takeaway that I had from the summer, and then I'll talk about the next steps for Eat Oregon Seafood. Next slide. 
Perfect. So to start off, what is Eat Oregon Seafood? Eat Oregon Seafood is an initiative that Oregon Seafood has really become a platform for the public to interact with the Oregon Seafood community. Um, and one big part of it has been connecting community members with local fishermen and really bridging that gap so that people feel more comfortable purchasing and supporting the Oregon Seafood industry. Next slide. So what was my role within Oregon's a whole bunch of different things this summer, but some of the main things I did was create some fun social media material to try and help people interact with Eat Oregon Seafood. I created educational videos that are up on our YouTube channel. I was able to do interviews up and down the Oregon coast, interviewing industry leaders in the Oregon seafood industry. And I was also able to yeah, yeah, was, with was other seafood leaders and get a lot of information from different commission leaders throughout Oregon. Next slide. So now I'll go a little bit more in depth into some of those projects that I just mentioned. First off, the fun social media material. So if you look to the right, I have a photo of a trivia slide. One of the cool projects that I worked on was creating these little trivia slides for our social media, where it just highlighted different Oregon seafood it had a recipe in between, and then it highlighted an answer for a question that we asked. Uh, and this was really important because it just gives people a way to interact with different Oregon seafood. It gives people a way to see maybe types of seafood that they didn't realize were part of the Oregon seafood industry. And that hopefully the recipes give people a way to try out new parts of Oregon seafood that they maybe didn't know exist. Another part of my projects was the educational videos. So there's a series up on YouTube now that talks about what Oregon seafood is, what makes the Oregon seafood industry important for the environment and the economies of Oregon, and how you can figure out how to purchase local seafood near you. That project was super fun for me because I know a lot of my friends and family don't 100% always understand how to purchase local Oregon seafood. And so I was able to share that with them. And since they always are sending me photos of them purchasing local seafood, which has been fun for me. Uh, and the last project I'll talk about is my biggest one, which is called the Oregon Seafood Journey, which is the photo to the left. And in this, I was able to do those interviews up and down the coast and meet and talk to a lot of really great people. I was able to talk to multiple restaurant owners, including Local Ocean and South Bay Wild. I was able to talk to seafood processors, such as Port Orford Sustainable Seafoods and Pacific Seafoods. I was able to talk to market retailers like Pacifica Seafoods in Corvallis, Oregon, which brings local seafood to the valley. And I was even able to talk to consumers after the Shop at the Dock event. Uh, and get their thoughts on Oregon seafood after they had gotten some information from the lovely Angie Dorr. Next slide. Uh, so this will be my takeaway slide. The video didn't come through on PowerPoint, so I'll have Jenny share it, but a really brief introduction into that. During these interviews that I did for the Oregon seafood journey, I didn't expect there to be as much continuity as there was between the different industry leaders. I kind of expected each one to have their own take on the Oregon seafood industry, but I was really surprised to find that everyone pretty much shared the same thoughts and no matter who they were or what their story was, they all had the same goals for the Oregon seafood industry. And so I made a little mashup of all the different interviews uh, in this clip in hopes that you would get just as much amazement out of the continuity in the Oregon seafood industry as I would. Okay, so I'll try the clip, McKay. Perfect, thank you, Jenny. Um, I can't hear anything. I don't know if anyone else can. Um, McKay, so let's see here. You know what? Let's try this. Let's try this. 
how managed it is, which is good in my opinion. It's a great thing. I think Oregonians should be super proud of Oregon fisheries and that we have this amazing resource right out our own back door. The one thing I think that people really should feel good about is that we have some of the best managed fisheries in the whole world. And that we're a very sustainable business and also that um, the Oregon fishing industry is very sustainable. Perfect. Thank you, Jenny. So that video just kind of showed that whether it was a restaurant owner or a processor or a consumer, no matter who they were, they really had the same message to get across, which I thought was pretty beautiful. Uh, and so on to my last little bit, what comes next for Eat Oregon Seafood and what comes next for me? So first off for Eat Oregon Seafood, as the initiative continues, Eat Oregon Seafood will continue to interact with the community on their social media platforms. And hopefully they will add a few more video introductory series on their YouTube channel. Uh, Angie and Jamie, my two mentors, are going to continue to do events such as Shop at the Docks in Newport, where they take locals and travelers and show them the docks of Newport and tell them how to purchase seafood directly from a consumer there. Um, and for me, what comes next for me, now I am in Guam, this is a photo of me doing this week out in the corals, uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that I'm not taking what I learned from Eat Oregon Seafood with me. Working more with social media this summer has inspired me to create my own science education YouTube channel that throughout my grad school experience, I am hoping to just post some scientific information about corals, about my research, and maybe I'll be able to reach some high school students who aren't sure whether or not they can become a scientist and inspire them into pursuing it as a career path. Next slide. So thank you to everyone. I learned so much this summer. Thank you to Oregon Sea Grant, to Jenny and Sarah, and especially to my mentors, Angie and Jamie. This was an amazing experience uh, and I got so much passion and love out of the projects. And I hope that you are all inspired to follow Eat Oregon Seafood on Instagram or Twitter or check out those lovely YouTube videos I was talking about. Uh, sorry again about the rocky start to the presentation, but thank you all for being here. Awesome job, McKay. I think that turned out all right. Okay, does anybody have questions for McKay about her project? Can you drop the YouTube link <laughs> for here? I really want to watch it. The video that I sent or the, the channel that I made? Your new channel. I want to be inspired by you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I have, uh, I'll send the information for the channel. And then I also have an Instagram where I just post underwater dive photos. So I'll share that too. I have a question for you, McKay. What was your social media experience going into this project? Uh, what'd you, what did you do ahead of time? Going into this project, so in order to prepare last term, I took a, like a late night video editing course with the program DaVinci. Um, and that was actually super helpful because being able to edit videos efficiently was very important for that. Um, and I also was in charge of the Oregon State uh, Women's Ultimate Team social media. I was the captain of the social media there last year. And so definitely a different vibe since it wasn't quite science education, um, but that gave me some experience with interacting with a larger group on social media. All right, thanks, McKay. We're gonna go ahead and move on to our next um, tag team speakers. Um, Jessica French and Lizette Perez, who are calling in from ODFW Human Dimensions team. Um, so whenever you're ready, you two, feel free to go ahead. All right, um, I'll share our screen. Try to.
All right. Are you guys seeing mostly a PowerPoint presentation? Okay, perfect. We had a little issue earlier where it wasn't working, but I think we figured it out. Awesome. Um, so this summer, Lisette and I were working um, the Human Dimensions Project for the Oregon Marine Reserves, monitoring the socioeconomic impacts of the Marine Reserve Program. A little bit about us. Hi guys, I'm Lisette. Nice to meet everyone. Um, yeah, so I am originally from Chicago and I attend the University of Missouri in Columbia. And I had lots of fun at here at ODFW and I'm happy to share what we did. Um, and it's probably a little bit familiar information, but my name is Jessica French. I'm studying marine biology at Oregon State. Um, I was born and raised in Oregon and the area and community I grew up in, but I was also not very familiar with coming into it. Can you guys hear us well? Oh. Okay. Okay, so to start, what is a marine reserve? Oregon's marine reserves are sections in Oregon's ter territorial waters that forbids the removal of marine life. They are dedicated to conservation and scientific research. The Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife is in charge of managing and monitoring, monitoring these sites. We also have marine protected areas, which are right next to the marine reserves. And in marine protected areas, there is some fishing allowed, but limited. And there are also restrictions on which fishing gears that can be used in MPAs. Um, a little history about the project um, and Oregon's marine reserves in general. Uh, they were started or the initiative started um, with Governor Klingowski in 2008 uh, by executive order where he ordered Oregon's coastal communities to be protected when considering the location for marine reserves and also coastal development. Uh, mostly pertaining to uh, tidal energy, like installations. Um, so that that executive order prompted Ocean Oregon's Ocean Policy Advisory Council, or OPAC, um, to work with various stakeholders and government agencies to come up with nine proposed sites for marine reserves that were eventually whittled down to five sites, um, and those were phased in with restrictions from 2012 to 2016. Um, Otter Rock um, off of Newport was the first location where monitoring began in 2010 and restrictions were put in place in 2012. Um, it's also the smallest reserve. Uh, our mentor, Tommy, calls it the uh, postage stamp reserve. <laughs> All right, so what are the goals of the marine reserves? And there's three main goals um, to start the first, wow, sorry guys. It's to conserve the biological diversity of the Oregon coast, to inform near shore management practices and to avoid adverse socioeconomic impacts on so ocean users, industries and communities. So the purpose of this project, in 2023, there is a required program check-in rep <clears throat> report. The check-in of the Oregon Marine Reserves Program will evaluate the different aspects of the program, including the scientific monitoring, outreach, community, community engagement, and the other features of the five sites. This would mark the point in which the state might include adaptive management of the marine reserve system. And what is adaptive management? It is the process of incorporating new scientific and prog programmatic uh, information in the implementation of a project or plan to ensure that the goals of the activity are being reached efficiently. It promotes flexible decision-making to modify existing activities or create new activities if new circumstances arise or if projects are not meeting their goals. Um, so the main way that uh, we're accomplishing the 
goal of avoiding adverse impacts and monitoring um, progress of the marine reserves, uh, human dimensions, science, human dimensions research, uh, which seeks to understand how people and communities interact with the natural environment and how they're impacted by conservation policies. Um, for our particular project, the focus was Oregon's marine reserves um, effect that they have on nearby businesses, as well as people coming to the coast to visit. Um, and uh, some of the research questions that the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife is hoping to answer through this project, as well as others, um, are how people, how, are people knowledgeable about the marine reserves? Uh, what are the public's attitudes towards the marine reserves? Uh, what other significant economic impacts of marine reserves or do marine reserves have on local communities? And what are the social impacts of marine reserves? And for our methods, um, to get a random sample, we would survey every fifth individual, starting off with the first person passing by our sites, choke points. And a choke point is basically an area which, it's typically like an entrance or an exit in those area in the marine reserve sites where there's a lot of congestion and we could easily um, grab individuals to survey. Um, these areas, yeah. We also conducted business surveys in seven different cities, Yaha, Garibaldi, Florence, Newport, Lincoln City, Otter Rock, and Depot Bay. And to stratify our sample, we would survey every other business in Newport and Lincoln City, and the others had each business survey. And we had four categories for each business, including lodging, retail, visitor services, and restaurants. And then using the information we gathered from the surveys, we would create a code book and it was important for data entry and everything was had a numerical code assigned to it based on different responses. Each one had a different code. And from there, we would use software like our studio to be able to create charts and tables to show our data that we gathered. Um, so this table is just showing a little bit of our preliminary results from the business surveys. Um, like Lisette mentioned, we were able to uh, take the data that we put into our database, which was basically a large Excel sheet, um, and enter, put, bring that into R to do some basic calculations, um, make some tables. Um, and this basically compares our baseline data that was collected between 2010 and 2015 to the data that we collected this summer. Um, as you can see, I think that the biggest change just from this table uh, was in the number of businesses that thought in 2010 and 2015, it would be that they thought that marine reserve implementation would harm their business or cause their business to decrease uh, compared to the surveys we did this year where very few actually of businesses surveyed actually saw that happen. Um, and the reason we have a little bit, as you'll see, a little bit more complete data from the business surveys is we were able to actually get all of those completed and the data entered and checked for accuracy uh, right about the time we did our first midsummer check-in. So we've had a lot more time to work with that data uh, compared to the visitor surveys, which I think we just did our last survey day yes. yesterday. <laughs> so we don't have that uh, entered yet and we haven't don't have it all checked yet and we haven't been able to do very much uh, analysis with that yet either, but that's coming. Um, that speaking of the visitor surveys, this is just some very like general uh, information about showing a little bit about like where we were surveying, um, about how many surveys we got in each area. 
um, and then or at each marine reserve. Um, and our total number of surveys now is almost 1500. Uh, this was from early, this number is from early August. And then uh, just a little breakdown of some of this actual more specific spots we went to in Cape Perpetua, just kind of to demonstrate that we really didn't get the same uh, number or proportion of surveys from each spot. There's a lot of variability in like how many people are walking by and um, basically how busy each spot was. Um, and then our last, this is my attempt at making a histogram with R, which obviously I still need to work on that quite a bit. Um, and the main takeaway I want to be shown from this is that so far, uh, most people have a really positive view of Oregon's Marine Reserves, which I don't know if I wasn't really expecting too much, but I definitely wasn't expecting like so many people to be on the like strongly supportive side. So that has been kind of cool to see that there are a lot of people out there who are supportive of conservation, uh, even if maybe knowledge and awareness might not be super high, but in general, people seem like excited about conservation. Um, and then for our last slide, we just wanted to see Grant and then the Department of Fish and Wildlife for making this internship possible, as well as Oregon State Parks and the Lincoln City Parks and Recreation Department, because they were running most of the spots we were hanging out in all summer. Um, Thank you guys so much. I can see someone's hand is raised, I think, but I can't, it won't let me move far. Great job, you two. <clears throat> you want to collapse your screen Greg. share? And then Greg has a question. Oh, yeah. Like. Hi, yeah, Greg. Thanks for the great presentation. Um, interesting work, and uh, I'm sure it was quite enjoyable. Um, I, I have a question about your, your slide on the businesses and the difference between the original stuff and the last one. Uh -huh. and maybe bring that up again, but what I what it looked like to me, what, you mentioned the biggest change being in those who thought it would initially be negative. And I, it appeared to me from that slide that the biggest change was actually in the number who were unsure, which appears to have increased by about 40 some odd percent if I did the, num the math right. Oh, right. you're correct. You're correct. Yeah. That okay. was my, we had some display issues. So like we thought we'd be able to see these like full sides with our presentation notes. And then we couldn't get like presenter view to show you guys the whole presentation and us our notes. So I was trying to like view oh, it yeah. on like the little, right. so I didn't have the view that I had when we practiced. <laughs> so that was uh, on me, but yeah, you are correct. And this also doesn't show, um, the chi-square test that we did because I didn't have time to get that table like looking nice for the presentation. Um, and so this doesn't necessarily show the actual like relationship or if there was a relationship between each one, it was just kind of meant to show like the big dramatic numbers difference a little bit, like a little drama for the presentation, but um, we should get more a like, clarification as like going forward, looking at like actually doing more of the analysis, like real analysis, um, which I'm gonna get to work on later in the summer or basically right after this. Sounds good, <laughs> thank you very much. I just wanted to make sure I wasn't uh, seeing things incorrectly. Oh, no, thank you for actually bringing that up because yeah, that was an error on my part. Awesome, you two. Way to squeak in the last few surveys right before the end of the program. I'm sure that was a super <laughs> labor intensive summer. Um, that was great. We're gonna jump over now to Lucas Parvin with the um, South Slough National Estuarine Research Reserve. So Lucas, whenever you're ready, feel free to jump in and share your screen. Great. 
Can you hear me? Yes, we can. All right. Hope I'm sharing the right screen. Okay, so hello everybody. In an unexpected turn of events, I had the opportunity to serve as an Oregon Sea Grant intern for the second summer in a row at the South Sioux National Estuary and Research Reserve, or SNR for short, in Charleston, Oregon. While my internship was all in person last year, about half my work this summer has been remote as I'm living in Corvallis. So today I'll be discussing both my in-person work in Charleston and my virtual work that I do in Corvallis. I should mention these pictures on screen were all recently taken in or around the South Sioux Reserve. So first off, I'd like to introduce the organization that I'm lucky enough to work with, which again is the South Sioux National Estuary and Research Reserve. I know it's a mouthful. While the South Sioux is its own entity, it's also part of the National Estuary and Research Reserve System, or NERS for short. And by now, I hope you can appreciate why these acronyms are so useful. Anyway, NERS consists of 29 coastal sites that are used to protect and study estuary and systems. If you look at the map to the right, which I took off of NOAA's website, you can see where all of the research reserves are located. Of course, the best one being indicated by the pointing red arrow. All of these reserves share four main focuses as they relate to the goals of NERS, and these include stewardship, research, training, and education. The stewardship focus pertains to keeping estuaries healthy and taking the proper initiatives to do so. The research that takes place at each reserve <clears throat> is shared amongst NERS, and then that data is used to aid in conservation and management of estuaries across the country. Training allows, res training allows reserves to help local and state officials to be better equipped with data that is used in decision-making processes. And then lastly, the education focus drives varying learning opportunities for members of the public at each reserve. This includes educational opportunities for both uh, children and adults to learn more about estuaries through hands-on activities, field work, lab experience, workshops, lessons, etc. cetera. Uh, and education teams also provide local schools with educational material and activities that can be used by teachers and their students. Recreational tours and activities are also led throughout the year that allow community members to engage in outdoor educational experiences. <laughs> and of course, all of these things take place at the original National Estuary and Research Reserve, also known as the South Slough. The South Slough was established in 1974, making it the first estuary and research reserve to be established. Our reserve consists of about 6,000 acres of land and is explored in many ways. Hiking trails along the reserve are open to the public, as well as areas available to launch kayaks or canoes. Much of the reserve is used for research and monitoring, though interpretive programs, coastal training programs, and of course, summer science camps are also provided on site. And if you look at the large image on this screen, you can see an overhead view of the estuary and where the visitor center is located, marked by the yellow pin, where much of the South Slough staff can commonly be found and where I spent much of my summer helping lead educational summer science camps, which brings me to my summer projects. So one of my projects this summer was to help lead summer science camps as a member of the education team. In this role, I helped coordinate camp schedules, assisted in logistical preparation, created educational materials, and led camp activities and lessons. Because the ages of campers range from kindergartners to high schoolers, depending on the camp, both the activities I had the opportunity to lead and the activities that I will lead range from silly educational games to teaching the scientific method through small experiments. One of my favorite activities to lead are educational hikes, which have allowed me to teach kids about how watersheds work, how to identify various plants and animals, and how to find signs of life in the forest through exploration and observation. On a typical camp day, my responsibilities might include setting up a classroom for activities, catching animals for observation, helping to check kids in and out of camp, driving campers to various field, uh, field trip sites, leading educational activities, distributing snacks, maintaining a safe and enjoyable learning environment, and of course, lots of cleaning up. And this summer, I have also been encouraged to lead activities that pertain to the research that I'm doing for my undergraduate thesis. So I've also been lucky enough to share some of that work with kids and get them thinking about how research can be conducted. Separately on non-camp days, I've also had the chance to help Jamie, my mentor, lead educational field trips and lessons for elementary students who go to school and read sport. And later this month, I'll also get to assist in leading a paddling trip uh, in the estuary with Eric, the kayaking master of the education team. 
So on weeks that I've been in Corvallis, my main job has to been has been to work on the creation of a touchscreen water quality exhibit that's going to be set up at the South Slough Visitor Center. This exhibit is being created to teach visitors about the system wide monitoring program or SWAP for short that monitors water quality data at all of the estuaries made up by NERS. Water quality is often something that can be overlooked by or unknown to the public, so increasing the general understanding of how water quality can affect coastal communities is important in accomplishing Sea Grant's goals. People interacting with this exhibit will be able to navigate through different pages that explain NERS, the swamp program, how water quality is measured, what parameters are important, and how various organisms are affected by these different parameters, such as temperature, salinity, turbidity, etc. The exhibit will also feature an interactive simulation that allows visitors to use sliders to change water quality parameters, which in turn will change the abundance of different organisms present on screen. For example, someone will be able to use a slider to manipulate the amount of dissolved oxygen in the water, which will affect the entire ecosystem, leading to an altered underwater community on screen. This project is pretty extensive and started first with lots of research in order to establish uh, how changes in water quality parameters affect local organisms of interest. I read uh, primary research articles on 12 different organisms ranging from pickleweed to harbor seals and created an Excel spreadsheet that detailed their livable water quality ranges as well as what ranges are ideal for them. While more organisms may be added to the simulation uh, later on, the main focus right now is to organize the overall layout of the exhibit and to convert slides made on PowerPoint to the software that's going to be used in the touchscreen exhibit. On this slide, you can see the welcome page that will prompt visitors to begin learning about water quality. They will then be directed to pages that allow them to choose their own learning path, <clears throat> such as this one or this one. Uh, and then if they choose to read about specific organisms that are affected by water quality, they will navigate to slides such as this one on eelgrass, as well as this one on Dungeness crabs. And then when this exhibit is finally complete, the welcome slide will prompt visitors to tap the screen to begin. They will have the opportunity to explore the NERS and SWAMP programs, what a variety of water quality parameters mean, how different organisms cope with the water quality, and then that they will also be able to select the interactive simulation. And after choosing a path, they will be able to learn about whatever they want and then return to the home screen and explore the other options. <clears throat> due, to the nine, due to the time needed to complete this exhibit and the learning, cur learning curve asso associated with the software, I will continue working remotely with the South SLU during the next few months so that I can ultimately help put together a complete product. With that being said, while the project seemed pretty daunting a couple months ago, it's really starting to come together now. So to wrap things up for the second summer in a row, I would like to extend my enormous appreciation to the entire South SLU staff. Jamie has been a great mentor for me for over a year now, and it's also always great to learn from <clears throat> and work with Daniel, Deborah, and Eric. I'd also like to thank my fellow education interns, Preston and Aurora, for being great colleagues this summer. I've gained so much experience at the South SLU from conducting field work to teaching kids, and while doing so, I've had a ton of fun I definitely had to have an attachment to the SLU and the people there. I would say I'll miss being at the South SLU and seeing the staff, but I think I'll be seeing more of them for years to come. The past two summers have without a doubt altered my career and professional trajectory in positive ways. And I'm very grateful for the time that I've got to spend at the South SLU. Thank you. Awesome, Lucas, great job. Thanks. So you've got a question from Liz Parati, which is, what are some tough or fun questions you get from kids on the education hikes? Tough or fun questions? Oh, man. Um, I really like explaining ecological relationships. So I like when they ask questions that pertain to that and why animals might be doing what they're doing. Tough questions. I mean, I get a lot of tough questions. I got a lot, I get a lot of insightful questions that I can't always answer. So I guess that's my answer to that. Great job. Well, sounds like the South Slough is lucky to have you back. Thank you very much. We're gonna switch gears now to our next speaker, um, Grace Roa with the OSU Department of Fisheries and Wildlife Project. Um, Grace, so whenever you're ready, feel free to share your screen. 
Awesome. Thank you, Jenny. Um, my The Wi-Fi here in Alaska is uh, questionable, so I'm going to also leave my camera off. And can everyone see it? Yep. Awesome. Alrighty. So, hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Grace Roa, and I graduated from the University of North Georgia in December. And I will be starting a marine resource management graduate program in uh, at Oregon State University in the fall, which I am super excited and super nervous for. Um, but uh, this summer, I did a internship with uh, OSU's Department of Fisheries and Wildlife and uh, USDA ARS, the Agricultural Research Service. And we looked at um, trying to determine the age and growth relationship between an ecosystem engineer Eupagibia pugetensis and its invasive parasite Orthione griffenis. And a theme for the slides is that um, we're going to have really fun shrimp pun titles. So catch them while you can. Um, but bridging the gap between economy and ecology, one shrimp at a time. Um, this is an ongoing project between USDA's ARS is Brett Dumbald and uh, OSU's John Chapman. And uh, ARS's goal is to have the competitive agricultural economy while enhancing its environment. And Brett does this by managing uh, burrowing mud and go shrimp to protect uh, Washington and Oregon's uh, oyster aquaculture. And then OSU's goal is to provide knowledge of conservation, sustainable use, and ecosystem restoration. And John does this by studying with lots of other people, um, the burrowing mud shrimp and its parasite to sustain the, uh, the shrimp's west coast populations. So a little info on the uh, project. It is a 10 plus years of shrimping around with this relationship. Um, it is actually, I think it's specifically 16 years currently, um, but we're looking at, at the relationship between Eupagibia pugetensis and Orthione griffenis. And this shrimp guy is uh, the Eupagibia and these are the Orthione griffenis. Um, but Eupagibia are native to the west coast of the United States from uh, Morro Bay, California, all the way up into Prince William Sound, Alaska. Um, and they live on the intertidal mudflats shown over here, um, where they work as ecosystem engineers by building these Y-shaped burrows that allow for oxygen and nutrient cycling to penetrate into the mud. Um, but however, their populations are declining up and down the West Coast. Um, and as you can see, several of the populations in uh, Washington have collapsed. Several of the populations in Oregon have been reduced. And there are even some local extinctions down here in uh, California. But so um, part of the reason for these collapses is Orthione griffenis. Uh, it's an invasive parasitic isopod that's introduced from Asia, likely through ballast water. Um, its introduced range spans the entirety of Eupagibia pugetensis, but goes even further south into uh, central Baja, Mexico. And as we have figured out from this week in Alaska, it goes all the way up to Sitka. And pending the rest of this week, we'll see if they go up to Juneau, but hopefully not. Hopefully Sitka is that um, top, top range. Um, and then, so the, Orthione settle up under the shrimp's carapace, as you can see here, um, and they attach up onto the gill structure. And the Orthione are uh, hermaphrodites. So the first one that settles is the female, the big one. And then the second one that settles turns into a male. So while they're attached to that carapace, um, to the gill structure, they're sucking hemolymph, which is kind of like our blood, um, from the shrimp out of its uh, carapace. And it essentially is able to suck enough hemolymph and energy from the shrimp to uh, effectively castrate the female host shrimp. So it keeps them from reproducing. Um, so then the shrimp search research so far, this is the rest of the story. Um, we know that uh, increasing orthione populations lead to eupagibia 
collapses. And we can see an example of that here from Willapa Bay, Washington, um, where populations of Orthione have been very low up until about 1998 when they kind of skyrocketed up. And then Upojibia populations are fairly standard until two years later in about 2000 where they kind of decrease and then they've been pretty pretty essentially extinct from there. Uh, you can still find a few here and there, but they're very rare in Wilpa Bay now. Um, and then we also know that, um, I just lost my train of thought. <laughs> Upojibia weight per length does not decline with increasing parasite load. So you can see that here, um, AKA we don't find any skinny shrimp. So it doesn't matter if you have a parasite or not, um, you're still gonna, have the same weight per length ratio as if you did if you didn't have a parasite. And that's something that's really weird and something we're really trying to figure out. Um, and then we also know that Orthi only, only settle in reproductive size shrimp. And you can see that here with the uh, percentage of infestation rate increases with an increasing carapace length. Um, and we do have a few. We actually had one this past week where it was nine millimeters, which was insane actually. The shrimp was nine millimeters, um, but usually the shrimp do not get invested until they're of reproductive size, which is about 15 millimeters. Um, so then what we don't know and are hoping that this data will help us figure it out is how these species grow and how their host and parasitic energetic relationship works together and how it affects them. So then this is what I do all day, every day, shrimp duties. Um, I got to do lots of field work, lab work, and data analyses. Um, so out in the field, you know, you put on your waders and your converses when you don't have wader boots and you go out and you play in the mud like you're a little kid again. Um, we use mud cores and uh, like yabby guns, which I like to call slurp guns. Um, so you go out and you pull up all of the stuff and you, all of the shrimp and anything else that comes up and you um, put them in these box sieves and these circle sieves and we go through them and we save the shrimp and um, kind of see what's going on, what's going on out there and keep them for us, take them back to the lab. Um, in which case here in the lab, we go through those samples and we look for data such as, you know, eupagebia sex and carapace length and whether they're infested, how many they have, orthione they have, what's the length, what's the sex of the orthione. Um, again, you know, the big one is the female and the little one is the male. And then take all of that data, throw it into an Excel sheet, Excel sheet goes into R and you look at it all, um, analyze it in your many, many hours of R, which is fun and terrible at the same time. <laughs> Um, but these are the results that we got. Um, so the, because the uh, female shrimp and the male shrimp, they grow in different kind of rates. Um, I analyzed them separately and the female distributions from all of these shrimp were collected in uh, May, 2021 in Yaquina Bay, right outside of Hatfield. Um, but so these are the di distributions and the Y axis are uh, on all of these graphs are the proportion or like you can think of it as a percentage, which is what I think of it as. Um, and then the X axis is the uh, carapace length of the shrimp. So it kind of shows you where all of the shrimp are. And like, if you were to pick up a shrimp with, you know, a certain, a certain, uh, carapace length, you will be able to figure out what size, like how old it is. And we do that with R and we put uh, the normal distribution curves and we fit it to the data. So for the female shrimp, we see that there are five, uh, five kind of size modes, age modes in the uninfested, I might lost my mouse, there we go, in the uninfested shrimp. So, and it starts with the settlement peak. So these shrimp are zero year old um, they just settled in May and we think that they grow all, so if you see here, we're kind of like missing. We think that they grow this much in the summer and they don't grow as much in the winter. Um, but so these are one-year-old shrimp and the, so they would have settled last year and our two-year-old shrimp settled two years ago and so on and so forth. And then in our infested shrimp, we did the same thing and it matches our, uh, 
it matches what we think. So the shrimp don't get, uh, there are no uninfest, no infested shrimp until after that 15 millimeter peak. Um, and so it, it goes along with what we think. So you don't really get infested until you're at least two years old. Um, hey, Grace, just a heads up, you're at eight minutes. Okay, sorry, I, real fast. Um, and then these are the male shrimp, same thing. Um, they, since they grow a little bit more steadily, they have six or they have the seven size age classes. And again, they start with the settlement peak and the uninfested and then the infested, they start around two. The males, it's more difficult to find the males. They don't get as infested as the females, which is another interesting kind of situation. Um, and then the ortheone is these uh, little scary creatures. And the same thing, so they grow, they have the five size classes, start with the settlers, they grow about four years. Um, I just completely lost my train of thought, but it's the same situation. Um, but ultimately uh, with these analyses, we'll be able to measure a shrimp or an ortheone and be able to tell how old it is based on its size. And then coming up next, like I said, going into graduate school, going to continue this project, um, hopefully develop a little bit better statistical analyses to go through them, um, go through our July samples and our Alaska samples that we are getting this week. Um, and then other population or other directions, uh, people are looking at the population genetics of Yupo and Ortheone and their uh, feeding habits. Um, so those are happening currently at University of Colorado Boulder, which is who we're in Alaska with. Um, but yeah, those are the future endeavors. And uh, I just want to say thank you to everyone involved. Awesome job. Thank you so much, Grace. That's a super cool project. Um, Yalin had a question for you. Um, she says, is there a reason for the drop in infestation rate at less than 35? Um, I don't know what the units are in length. Oh yeah, millimeters. Yes. Um, so we think that the we think that it happens because the 35 millimeter shrimp are much older. Uh, so we think that they kind of we think the shrimp kind of outgrow the uh, parasites. So we think that the parasites are on the shrimp and they live their whole life and then they die is what we are thinking is happening. Um, so that's why they lose that uh, that parasite that lose that infestation rate. Awesome, thank you. So um, we're gonna last but not least hear from our, our student Yellen Lee, who has been working with the Oregon Coordinating Council on Ocean Acidification and Hypoxia. Um, so Yellen, whenever you're ready, you can share your screen. And I do think we'll have time for more general questions from the audience um, once Yellen is done speaking. Go ahead, Yellen. Second. Sorry, I'm just trying to get my slides open. Okay. Okay. Hold on. The, okay. okay. You ready? Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Yalin Lee. I just recently graduated from the University of Oregon um, with my bachelor's in environmental science, and I'll be heading off to UC Davis in the fall to get my master's in environmental policy and management. And so I've been working with the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, as well as the Oregon Coordinating Council on Ocean Acidification and Hypoxia, or the OAH Council, on a project focused on increasing awareness of ocean acidification and hypoxia. And so just kind of a little bit of an overview of what I've been doing this summer. Um, kind of the first couple of weeks, I was just reading literature on how OAH has been affecting all of our Oregon species. And in doing so, I've been drafting up infographics to kind of condense down all the information that I've learned in a more kind of palatable way for the public in, in the term of infographics, because no one wants to read about 200 um, scientific papers just to get the information that they want. Um, and also during the process, I was participating in various meetings, including the Pacific Coast Collaborative, the Shellfish Program, the Marine Resource Program, and of course the OHA's Council meeting. And so just an overview of what is ocean acidification and hypoxia. Ocean acidification is called, is um, the change in seawater chemistry, which we typically associate with, with a decrease in pH. And so this is caused by um, how the ocean absorbs the carbon dioxide emissions, as you can see in the diagram. The ocean absorbs about 25% of the atmosphere CO2 that is um, produced by fossil fuel combustion. 
And so this reaction um, causes a decrease in pH, but it also causes a decrease in minerals in the ocean, specifically calcium carbonate, which is really essential for our species to create um, bones and the production of cell shells. And so when um, this, as ocean acidification is increasing by about 30% worldwide, we're seeing a huge um, decrease in the, abil the species' abilities to um, conduct calcification. And so hypoxia is simply defined as low oxygen, but also more specifically, um, dissolved oxygen levels of less than 1.4 milliliters of oxygen per liter of seawater. And so here in the Pacific Northwest, we actually have a naturally occurring hypoxia season that's driven by a process called upwelling. And so upwelling is um, something that happens during the spring and summer here in the Pacific Northwest, where northerly winds will come along the coast and push away the seawater. And in doing so, um, this much deeper, colder, and then really nutrient-rich water will rise to the surface in, the, in its place. And due to this increase in um, productivity, it will cause these huge plankton blooms. And as these plankton blooms die and decompose, they further um, take water, take oxygen out of the water, causing these huge oxygen depletion zones. And so as both of these are actually primarily driven by a lot of um, similar effects of climate change, we're seeing um, effects of those climate factors uh, drive ozonocytopenia and hypoxia, specifically a rising sea temperature, which is actually exacerbating hypoxia. And currently we're in one of the most intense and earliest occurring hypoxia seasons that hasn't ever been reported here along the Pacific Northwest. And so why should we care about these? Uh, one of the big things is that we're seeing a lot of um, ecosystem and species specific impacts. Um, one of the big things that's been kind of rising research is kind of how um, features are changing where they are being found. Like for example, um, some of the salmon might be um, changing their um, migration patterns and maybe how they might be shifting distributions like at different places in the water column just to kind of avoid these conditions. And then um, there's also been a promotion of hypoxia tolerant species which has um, food um, effects on the food pyramid and also just overall ecosystem dynamics. And then we've also seen a lot of impacts on various fisheries primarily the cow species where we've seen huge die off events um, when the hypoxia season rises up. And so to counteract these issues in 2017, um, Oregon created the OAH Council um, and this council created the Oregon um, OAH Action Plan, which is kind of just like um, the layout of all of Oregon's strategies to combat this issue. Um, it's broken down into five major themes. And the theme that I'm personally working on is theme number four which is to raise awareness of OAA science, impacts, and solutions. And as I mentioned earlier, I am creating an infographic. And so I'll just kind of talk through kind of the process that I've been going through this summer to create these infographics. The first things that I said is that I did a very comprehensive literature search um, of primary literature, which includes scientific articles, theses, and dissertations. Um, and also while I was doing this, I was creating um, kind of a document of all the keywords that I was putting into um, Google Scholar and the Web of Science, which are the, um, the search engines that I was using. Just so in the future, I know as more um, primary literature comes out, someone can repeat this process and know exactly all the steps that I took so they can just do um, the exact same process that I did to get all the literature. And then once I got all the literature, um, I would read and review them. And I'll kind of take out all the key points and summarize um, the paper into a couple sentences and put everything into a spreadsheet. And then once we ever read everything, I scored a literature based on uh, these five, six categories of reproduction, growth and development, physiology, behavior and activity, survival, and calcification, which is specific to OH due to um, what I talked about earlier. And so like an example of this would be like if the paper was like, oh, we see acidification affect the metabolism of crabs, then we put that into um, physiology. Or we see um, how hypoxia might be driving um, changes in salmon, like migration, then we put that behavior and activity. And then once I have all the literature um, read and reviewed, I will start draft I started drafting all the, the infographics, specifically in Adobe Illustrator, which has been a whirlwind of <laughs> motion ride to figure out. And then uh, once I have those drafts created, um, once I feel like they're pretty solid, we've been sending out to review, uh, specifically with the Marine Resource Program, the OAA Council, and a couple others. And actually earlier this week, I did a brown bag presentation to a couple of the, um, the employees to so they can see what the couple of the drafts we're working on and just give feedback on what they prefer and also what species they think we should include. So after we get all of our feedback back, um, we'll edit it again based on feedback, then we'll send out for review again and then get feedback, so, so on and so forth until we get a draft that makes the most number of people happy that we can. And just here, we're just showing um, two of the drafts that I showed um, earlier this week at the Brown Bag presentation. This was voted as the fan favorite among all the people that came to the presentation. And so as you can see, um, kind of the main focus of these infographics is to show like what species are at risk. 
from hypoxia or, or, and or acidification. And so we have these kind of like three categories of um, whether they're resilient to these conditions or there be negative impact with these conditions, but there's kind of been mixed responses just so we can see like um, if meat, certain species might need more management than others. And then another big thing is that uh, we're also showcasing where there might be like lulls in data, because while these are still like pretty prominent conditions, there isn't a lot of data, especially on all the species that we care about. And so all the white circles or ovals that you see are about places where we, are, we need more research to under, properly understand how these species are being affected by these conditions. And so just talking about kind of an overview of the summer um, and kind of moving forward. Um, so I've built a lot of my skills in science communication and graphic design. And also one of the big things that coming into this internship, I really want to learn how to like utilize scientific research and policy and management. Because in my undergrad, I got a lot of research experience specifically in labs, but I never really learned how to like apply that into like a way that is like more usable in policy and management, as well as really communicate science because I've written scientific papers, but again, the general audience probably won't want to read a scientific paper. And so kind of learning how to like summarize all that data was a really um, important skill for me to learn. And also just knowing how to like use that and apply it to things um, for us to actually properly manage these species. And also build my skills in graphic design, which is not something that I ever thought I would really learn. <laughs> That's not really, you know, my, my forte, but it's been a really fun skill to learn. And I think sure it will come very helpful as I continue on. And so as I said earlier, I will be going to UC Davis to get my master's in environmental policy and management, where I will continue to learn even more about how to utilize science in um, the field of policy and management. And as to finish off the summer, I will be continuing any new infographics, which ones I showed earlier are still drafts. So there's still lots of editing that we need to do um, before we can publish them. And hopefully we'll get those out in a couple of weeks or months. And also just work on a, a couple of other outreach material um, along with you. And just so just to thank you to Oregon Secret, ODFW um, and the Oregon Council for making this internship happen. And specifically my mentor Liz for being like the best, best mentor I could have asked for. She's very supportive and great, gives good from that feedback. And of course, thank you all for listening. Great job, Yellen. Um, it looks like you could use the services maybe of OCoin to fill in some of those missing data gaps that you have in your infographics. Um, does anyone have questions for Yellen? We can also open it up um, as well to questions for some of the other summer scholars. I have a question for Yalin. Um, nice job on your presentation. I really enjoyed it. Um, so you work really closely with ODF and W. Were there any other um, agencies or organizations that you worked with um, in terms of gathering this information or any that you um, uh, maybe were curious about uh, learning more uh, from or talking to more people from those organizations? Yeah, I think a big thing I learned throughout this uh, time is that like people work in like all different things. Like Liz kind of just works in like a thousand different projects at once. And so there's a lot of interconnection. And so I think I, what's the big thing about me is I kind of learned a lot about different agencies that I probably wouldn't have learned about otherwise. Like the Pacific Coast Collaborative um, is part of the wider like um, Ocean Hypoxia Alliance that connects um, Oregon, Washington, California, and also British Columbia. Alone there's a lot of, co of collaboration like all across the Pacific Coast. And so I think it's gonna be nice to me to learn about different things and also seeing how they all kind of interconnect. And so there are definitely a um, couple of different agencies I'll be interested in learning, especially seeing how they all have kind of ties to California. So I might try to dip into those ties in California while I'm there. Oh, I'm muted, sorry. <laughs> yeah, there was a question that directed to me, uh, where can my information I've gathered? So um, there is an OA8 Council website. So once the inf infographics are gonna be um, published, we're gonna publish also like um, a word cited page of both of all the literature that we have. I don't know if we're publishing the word, the, the spreadsheets, but, but you will get this a list of like 300 papers that we've read to um, make these infographics. Looks like Liz has put a link in the chat. Um, okay, well, thanks everyone. Um, I'm gonna do a little emoji of clapping for the students. I thought they all did a great job today. Um, and uh, we have a few minutes if folks have more questions and wanna ask any more questions of the presenters, 
Uh, we're grateful for your participation and your support of these students today. Um, I'm so proud of the work that they've done in what was once again sort of a strange work environment this year with COVID constraints. So um, they've they've done a great job. So I'll stick around and the students can stick around. If anybody has further questions, please let us know. Um, otherwise, we'll see you next time. And students, it looks like we've been getting all kinds of feedback for you through the feedback form. So I'll sort through those um, later today and then send them out to you so you have some feedback on your presentations. Um, and I'll also send you a copy of this recording. Thank you, Jenny. Grace, I see that you're still on. Can I ask you what your next field work plans are? You said you're headed up to Juno, is that right? Yeah. Um, John and uh, Joshua are in Juno uh, right now. They apparently, I just got an update, so that was why I missed whatever the last thing you said was, um, but they were updating me because I made them all not be in the room while I was giving my talk. So they secretly watched it from the other room. Um, under codename Alex. That was who the Alex was. Um, sorry. Um, John and Joshua are up in Juno currently, and um, apparently they did not get any shrimp today, but they went and talked to um, an invasive species uh, coordinator up there who's going to link them up with a few iNaturalist people, um, see if they can get some shrimp in tomorrow. They're only going to be there until the 15th, I think. And then they're coming back down to Ketchikan where I am. And then we'll head back to Oregon on the 18th. Sounds like it's been busy. Yes, yes. Much, much shrimp, very long days. There's lots of candy at our Airbnb though, so that's good. Awesome. Okay, well, I think I think that wraps it up for today. Um, so thanks everybody. I'm gonna shut this thanks, down. Thanks, Jenny. Bye-bye.